Perfect. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for uh, for hanging around till late in the afternoon to uh, uh, to talk to uh, to a few nuclear issues. I think you had uh, Bill Perry and George Shultz earlier, did you not? I'm sure that was uh, remarkable in itself. Uh, they talk about the dark side of nuclear, I guess, in a, in a way. And, uh, they didn't get too much on nuclear. They did not, actually. Okay, good, good. Well, uh, that's my role and my lot here today. Uh, as, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, I get into nuclear through a kind of a convoluted path. Uh, in order to command a nuclear aircraft carrier, you have to be two things. You have to be an aviator and you have to be a nuclear engineer. And since those two things do not occur naturally in nature, uh, what the, uh, the Navy did was find someone with a technical background. I had a couple of master's degrees in aerospace engineering. They sent me to nuclear power school for two years, and when I came out, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to command a nuclear aircraft carrier. And that gave me my, uh, my entree, if you will, into, uh, into nuclear power. And when I left the Navy, as Mark mentioned, I ran the self-regulatory entity for the commercial nuclear industry in the United States called the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, formed within months after the uh, mishap at Three Mile Island. Uh, it doesn't do advocacy. It does uh, safety oversight. If we're going to have these things, they're going to be run as safe and as well as they can possibly be run. I also represented the U.S. in the World Association of Nuclear Operators, which is an organization that, uh, that oversees the, uh, the international piece. And I was in Japan uh, after Fukushima. I was uh, in uh, Russia, in Murmansk, looking at their nuclear icebreakers. I've spent a lot of time traveling the world, looking at various nuances of nuclear power, including into the Emirates and looking at their project under construction over there. So that's kind of my nuclear background, if you will. And uh, with that, I'd like to, uh, to move into a, uh, a little bit of history. I, don't, I only t know two nuclear jokes. This is one of those. So uh, <laughs> those of you that, uh, that get it, uh, laugh. And if you don't, well, I'll explain it to you afterwards. I would like to talk a little bit about history, though, because I think without the context for that, you don't really quite understand where we are in our dialogue about nuclear and what the options are going forward. Uh, in the upper left, you see the, uh, uh, the first atomic uh, reactor, the first nuclear reactor built by Enrico Fermi in a squash court under the stadium at the University of Chicago. OSHA would not let you do that today, I am reasonably assured. Uh, even though uh, uh, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann had first uh, split the atom in 1938, it had not been uh, sustained reaction generated until December 2nd of uh, 1942, at, uh, at which point uh, Fermi was, uh, was successful in, uh, in doing that. And uh, he sent a coded message, this was part of the Manhattan Project, uh, saying uh, uh, the, uh, the Italian explorer has landed in the New World. And the question from the other end, so how are the natives? And he wrote back, very friendly. So that was a signal that it was successful. It led to the, uh, the uncontrolled release of energy that was reflected in, uh, in first the Trinity test and then the two devices that were used at the end of, uh, of World War II. But the real focus began when people started to explore how can we use this energy for other purposes. And that's where Admiral Hyman Rickover came along uh, with the, uh, the Navy nuclear program. We talk a lot about subsidies today and what's the role of government. But in a real sense, the commercial nuclear enterprise not just in the U.S., but throughout the world, was built on the back of that experience, the, uh, the effort to build a, uh, a nuclear power plant for a, uh, for a nuclear submarine. Interestingly enough, we, uh, we laid the keel on that submarine in June of 1952, and it was uh, launched uh, 18 months later in 1954. We can't write the specification for a submarine in 18 months now. It just goes to show you how, how things have changed. Uh, recognizing the power of the atom, uh, uh, as you may be aware, Dwight Eisenhower gave a speech on the floor of the United Nations in 1953 talking about the atoms for peace and the possibility of stripping the military patina off this power source and using it literally for the good of all mankind. He actually went so far as to propose a way in which all nuclear weapons could be kept under international control. Obviously, the Russians and other factors intervened, and that's not the way things played out. But we began an effort to explore what's in the realm of the power possible for the betterment of mankind. In the lower right, you see an artist's concept of a nuclear rocket. Uh, actually, a, uh, a non-flight worthy version of this was actually tested, where they blew uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen over uh, uh, fuel plates in a reactor. And uh, the adiabatic expansion of that through a nozzle generated thrust. It's actually remarkably efficient, uh, specific impulse wise, because you, you only have the oxidizer. You don't have a fuel anymore. Uh, in fact, uh, it had other problems, though. The oscillation and vibration started spitting parts of the, uh, the nuclear reactor out through the nozzle. And that really wasn't uh, what they had intended. Original thoughts were they're going to use it as the second and third stage of the Saturn V moon rocket. But they decided that the folks in South Florida might not approve. And, but uh, according to press reports, the Russians are going to test a version of this next year. So uh, don't give up. Uh, this is a uh, 
artist concept of the WS-125, which is a nuclear-powered airplane that was proposed in the, uh, in the 50s. This happens to be the Lockheed Martin design. There was another one that, uh, that Convair had proposed. Again, the thought was great. You know, you've got airplanes that can stay airborne forever. And if you remember during the Cold War, we had airplanes that were on constant alert. And the idea that these things could go up in orbit and not have to be refueled was, uh, was a concept that, unfortunately, when they put the reactor in, a B-36 shielded it all and took it off. It had no room for any payload. So uh, that, too, didn't, uh, didn't quite work out. Anybody know this? It's a 1958 Ford Nucleon a concept for a nuclear-powered automobile that Ford had produced. That is not a Continental kit on the back. That is the nuclear reactor that would be replaced at your local gas station about every 10,000 miles. And uh, a one-third scale model of this still exists at the Ford Dearborn Museum in Michigan. Obviously, a working model was never produced. <clears throat> one of the things that did work, however, was what you see in the lower left. This was the concept that uh, that moved the, uh, the concept of naval nuclear propulsion into the generation of electricity. And, uh, and at one point, there were as many as 237 nuclear plants ordered in this country. Uh, this was going to be uh, the game changer, if you will. We don't understand today, and, and you're not nearly old enough to appreciate how important this was and how things that were atomic and nuclear, this was the dot-com of its time. I mean, this was going to change life. They were going to produce electricity, literally, the quotation was, too cheap to meter. In other words, you were going to do it like your cable company. You were going to pay a monthly fee, and you could take as much electricity as you wanted because it was going to be so low cost. That, too, didn't quite play out. It was complicated by the events that, uh, that we're all familiar with. And, uh, in, uh, in 1979, at the Three Mile Island accident, where one of uh, two operating nuclear plants melted down. Even though the radiation release was minor, about one-sixth of what you get in a chest x-ray, according to quantification from the Kemeny Commission, the fact of the matter is the public lost confidence in this. The bloom was off the rose. The miracle that was supposed to be good for everybody had proven not to be. And as a result, 97 nuclear plants were canceled in this country. You can take a tour across the United States visiting the shell of partially complete nuclear plants still today. About four years ago, uh, the, uh, well, the folks at uh, TVA actually completed a, a reactor that had been abandoned and, uh, and started it up and, uh, because the, uh, the opportunity uh, presented itself. But clearly, the industry had to do something to recreate and regenerate confidence in it. One of the things they did was found the organization which I was privileged to lead for about seven years, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. The, uh, the gentleman on the left is Bill Lee, who was then the, uh, uh, the chief operating officer and later the chairman and president of, uh, of Duke Power. The guy on the right is Dennis Wilkinson. Doesn't mean anything to you, but he's a retired three-star admiral, was Rick Over's protege, was the first commanding officer of that submarine I showed you in the first slide, the USS Nautilus, and obviously a, uh, a prototypical nuclear expert. Again, this is what INPA was all about. It was to deal with the, uh, the questions of industry safety and integrity, the fear of the unknown, uh, the loss of public trust. It was prohibited by law and by premise and, uh, and concept from being an advocate. If you're going to inspect these plants five weeks every two years, on-site, intrusive, no nonsense, no holds bar, shut them down if they don't operate uh, well kind of thing, then you can't be an advocate. Really, that's the challenge the old Atomic Energy Commission faced in its early days. It was supposed to regulate and oversee safety. At the same time, it was going to do advocacy. In some sense, that's what the, the Japanese are wrestling with as they try and restructure their regulatory process. So INPO does not replace our own Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but it's complementary in that regard and, uh, and has uh, uh, had some, uh, some reasonable success. In uh, 1979, when TMI occurred, the average time, the capacity factor, for those of you that know electricity and grid and generation, uh, of the nuclear fleet in the United States was 63%. In other words, of the possible time you could be online generating Electricity. They were only online 63% of the time. Uh, last year, they were online 92% of the time. And the rest of the time, they were down for, uh, for routine maintenance. So it kind of shows you the dramatic changes in reliability and safety associated with that. In 1979, the average nuclear reactor, commercial nuclear reactor in the United States, scrammed due to an emergency shutdown. Not the catastrophic kind of thing, but hey, something's not right. We're going to shut it down and then fix it and then start up. The average nuclear reactor scrammed seven times a year. The average scram rate for a nuclear reactor in, uh, in the United States today is zero. 
the median uh, of those. And so it just does not happen in the way that it used to. Again, a tribute to the reliability and improved training and the like. Uh, and again, there are some other issues that uh, if you're interested in, we can talk about later that why does, how does self-regulation really work? How can this be? How can you regulate yourself? How can the industry fund this entity and also be responsive and reflective of its demands and its expectations? And it's, a, it's an interesting concept. But the outcome is very, very different. What you see there in the upper left is Three Mile Island today. Okay, that's, uh, that's uh, plant number one there uh, that's, uh, that's steaming, and plant number two, the one that was forever shut down there on the left, it's the people that made it happen. Uh, the capacity factor is what I described to you, 92%, and that's the nu number of nuclear reactors in the United States. And it's declining, not because of safety concerns, but because they can't compete in merchant environments with natural gas at $2 a therm. What are the implications of that going forward in terms of emissions and the like when we start dealing with, as Scylla talked about so well, the infusion of renewables in there, and you're going to have to have something to provide baseload generation when those aren't available or the storage is, is not sufficient. How do you think about that going forward and that's what I'll talk about uh, later in the, in the, in the talk. Uh, as a parenthetic uh, insertion, I was asked to testify in front of the, uh, the President's Commission on the Gulf Oil Spill as they explored whether to demand a self-regulatory model be imposed on the oil and gas industry. I went and talked about the things, uh, some of which I've shared with you, why INPO worked and the like. This was the conclusion in their report. Regrettably, uh, that has not been acted upon, and the oil and gas industry still does not have an independent self-regulatory entity. <clears throat> uh, there have been some mishaps along the way. You're familiar with the Chernobyl accident, uh, a uh, RBMK-1000, a uh, graphite block, uh, uh, automatic control, graphite moderated uh, uh, reactor of an old design, uh, unstable, had a uh, positive uh, uh, void coefficient. That may not mean much to you non-nuclear engineers, but it means that it's got to be continually uh, controlled, otherwise it will go divergent. And, uh, and in fact, that's what happened when they decided to exercise an unapproved test without, uh, uh, by disabling all the safety devices. And so what happened was not a nuclear explosion, it was in fact a steam explosion, uh, but it, uh, it broke the reactor apart and uh, with results that, uh, that we all know. Uh, 31 immediate victims and 140 shortly thereafter, the, uh, the first responders, and evacuated a 30 kilometer circle around that, uh, that reactor in a, in a sarcophagus where it exists today. An interesting thing, you may have seen some of the documentaries on what's happened within that, uh, uh, that radius of the, uh, of the plant. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting, not exactly what people anticipated. Fukushima Daiichi, a bit of a different situation. An old uh, generation one, generation two reactor plants. There were, uh, there were six of them on this site, uh, right on the water. Uh, when they got the, uh, the unexpected uh, earthquake, things shut down automatically as they were supposed to. Uh, what they were not prepared for was the magnitude of the tsunami. They built a seawall that was uh, 15 feet high. The tsunami was 46 feet high. Obviously, that didn't work, but also some problems with design. The reactor switch gears, the electric distribution was below grade level, which means they became swimming pools. Electricity doesn't like that very well. Uh, the, uh, the thing, uh, the tsunami swept away the uh, uh, the power, or the, the fuel for the emergency diesel generators, they too were knocked out. The irony is that uh, in citing this to reduce the pump head from the seawater for cooling, they had actually ground down the cliff, uh, you know, uh, by 100 feet to make it uh, nearly sea level. If the, if the plant had been in place where it was originally built on the original cliff, we wouldn't have had the, uh, the outcome we did there. But obviously, there were no radiation fatalities. There were two gentlemen that were in between the earthquake and the tsunami doing an inspection in one of the basements, and they unfortunately were inundated by the tsunami. And then uh, someone else who was operating a crane was crushed when the, uh, when the tsunami uh, uh, destroyed the crane, but no radiation casualties. Uh, that has had a great effect here in the United States on the optics associated with, uh, uh, with nuclear energy, there is no doubt, but even more so in, uh, in selective countries around the world. Germany, for example, is elected to, uh, to, uh, to, to begin to close down its nuclear program, even though they went, ran one of the, the best and, and safest in the world. But in other places around the world, it's booming. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, there's lots of growth out there. There's over, there's 63 nuclear reactors under construction around the world. There are exploration studies uh, ongoing in, uh, in, in countries like, uh, like Turkey and Jordan and, and other places. Uh, even uh, Vietnam is exploring uh, whether uh, nuclear power might be adequate for them. Uh, 45 countries in all are expressing interest. There are real challenges with that. 
How does the regulatory process work? What's the oversight look like? How do they understand the seriousness of this industry? If you build and start up a nuclear reactor as a nation, you are in that business for 100 years. For 100 years, in order to deal with the waste and the fuel and the, and the residual radiation, should you decide to back out of it the next day, that's how long you're going to be dealing with this. So it's a commitment that people need to understand. And uh, as you might imagine, it needs to be done well. Uh, lots of people are beginning to think about nuclear differently, though. Uh, and again, I'm not here to sell you anything, but someone you just saw, Steve Chu, had this to, uh, to say about it. And uh, there really is a wonder if the climate math can work, uh, given the uncertainties we have and the technologies and the like, without nuclear. The idea of nuclear goes away and you replace it with natural gas, you're replacing something that's effectively zero uh, uh, carbon emissions with something that has 50% that of coal. Steve Chu has some very strong uh, per opinions on that. Uh, you can see what Ernie Moniz has to say about it. Even NASA has uh, come out with a formal study saying coal and gas are far more harmful than, uh, than nuclear power uh, writ large. We put, in this country, two and a half billion, that's with a B, metric tons of stuff in the air burning fossil fuels every year to generate electricity. No matter what your views are on climate change, global warming, and the like, that's just not healthy. And so how do you deal with that effectively going forward is something that people are going to wrestle with. Richard Lester, who's chairman of the Nuclear Engineering Department at MIT, has said that, and, and James Hansen obviously uh, believes that by pushing towards an all-renewable uh, portfolio, you are going to force the, uh, uh, the folks to move to, uh, to a natural gas uh, and fossil backup, and that that ultimately is going to result in, uh, in more degradation of the environment, not less. There are new nuclear technologies on the cusp. You've seen some of the, uh, the reports here locally. Uh, there are about 19 startups of various stripes that are exploring different nuclear technologies. When you think about it, nuclear has not had a lot of research and development applied to new concepts since its inception. I talk about all the things that Admiral Rickover did that were good, creating this and ensuring a culture of safety in the Navy. In the Navy, we used to call him the kindly old gentleman. Well, he was one of those things. He was old. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, it is perhaps the true that by pushing the, uh, the light water reactor technology, even though all of these technologies that you see here, with the exception of fusion, were, were demonstrated in the 50s and 60s, none of them were further explored or, or even exploited and considered as alternatives in the commercial sector. What's in the realm of the possible now? With all of the solid state devices, the approaches to safety, the, uh, the awareness that we have and the sensitivities, is it too early to take this off the table is a, is a fair question. And as you saw earlier, some really thoughtful people, Nobel laureates, a number of them, are asking, uh, we ought to give this uh, another chance. We ought to take a, take a look at this because we think uh, we can't get to where we need to go without it. Uh, these are some of the benefits they tout. Uh, and they deal with all of the historic nuclear concerns, and I'll talk about that very candidly here in a moment as well. The primary one is cost. Uh, small modular reactors and, and, and other options have the potential to come down that learning curve to do things incrementally and uh, uh, build things that, uh, that can be produced much more quickly and reduce the financing costs and, the, and, and get back to closer to what they call the overnight costs in the utility industry or what it would really cost to, uh, to build the thing if you could buy and build it today. The cost effectively doubles over the 10-year life of a construction of a nuclear power plant because of the costs of financing and the like. And so all of these things have to be a part of it. You heard Scylla talk about the need for load following and the, and the flexibility associated with that. All of those things are possible in new versions of nuclear, according to, uh, uh, to a number of the proponents and, uh, and are being researched and considered. So what does the future look like? Don't know. Uh, the jury's still out. Even uh, the co-founder of Greenpeace, Patrick Moore, has, uh, has come out in favor of this. We've, we've got waste issues we need to be able to deal with. You see a picture there on the left of, of Yucca Mountain. That's an above-ground storage area hypothesized on the right uh, that uh, New Mexico has already volunteered to build with dry cask storage and the like. And so there are, there are options out there for dealing with these kinds of things, but we are going to have to, in the final analysis for nuclear, address the safety issues, the environmental realities, the economics, the public acceptance issue. There is a fear out there of the unknown. The irony is people are willing to accept other risks, you know, the risks that I talk about with the, the billions of, of metric tons that we put into the air, the risks associated with coal mining. And 2015 was the safest year in U.S. coal mining history. Only 14 people died 
Okay, and the number of people that have been killed in nuclear plants and the nuclear accidents in the U.S., of course, zero. Now, that's a different context, and, and it's risks that you accept versus risks that you think are being pushed on you by government. There's a sociological dimension to this that would have to be effectively addressed. And then finally, it needs a national policy and, uh, and a solution to the spent fuel reprocessing issues or storage issues. You ask, uh, how do other nations do it? A number of nations reprocess. This, the irony is when we take spent fuel out of a commercial nuclear reactor after three burn cycles, is how long it's in there, 95% of the energy is still in it. It's just been poisoned by the actinides and no longer is suitable for, uh, for nuclear fission. So five other countries around the world reprocess. They take out the 5% of poison and, and bring the 95% that's reusable back. So it's, it's not quite a perpetual motion machine, but it has the potential uh, to do that. Uh, the U.S. as a matter of policy, since Jimmy Carter has elected not to reprocess and, uh, and has not reversed that, but this is a, a graphic depiction of the fact that 95% uh, that of uh, what we call spent fuel is reusable or recyclable in today's parlance. Uh, James Lovelock, uh, uh, noted environmentalist and creator of the Gaia Hypothesis, has said this, uh, but there are some long-term issues that have been plaguing that, that the nuclear industry needs to pay attention to. Uh, we talked a lot and a focus for decades on prevention of, uh, of any mishaps. Well, you also need to deal with the response side of it, and Fukushima reminded us of that, and it's completely changed the way the U.S. industry approaches that, the facilities, the deployable units, the immediate response, all of the things that, uh, that the Japanese uh, struggled with a bit. Uh, the U.S. Is, and, and the world are now much more attuned to. New relationships amongst those who oversee these, uh, the safety of these, uh, these entities uh, is important. The government's role, the, the private sector's role, uh, the utilities' role, and certainly even nonprofit role. The international dimensions, huge dimensions here. I mean, there's 440 nuclear uh, power plants operating, nuclear reactors operating around the world. Okay, we're only a fraction of that. We're less than 100 now. And declining. So how are those being done, and how well are they being built, uh, safely, safely operated, and, uh, and effectively uh, overseen and shut down when the need arises? There's a real challenge with all of this, but there's a, there's a real opportunity as well, depending on how you think about it. Uh, Stuart Brand of the Whole Earth Catalog, uh, is, is re he's on record of, uh, as, as supporting nuclear. What you see in the upper left are, are versions of the small modular reactor I spoke to earlier where they're much smaller, maybe 200 uh, megawatt designs. You can buy them one, two, or a six pack, if you will, link them all together. You can build them in the US. We can't build any of the large nuclear power plant reactor, the vessels or, or steam generators in the US anymore. We've lost the, the steel processing capability. We have to buy those from Japan or China or, uh, or France if we're going to do it. Uh, these are options that uh, they're self-contained, they're passive, they shut themselves down if there's a problem. These are some of the designs that are being proposed. And in the lower right, uh, finally, you see uh, uh, the Lockheed Martin design for a uh, fusion reactor. Now, the old physics joke for you physics folks is that fusion is 20 years away, and it has been for the last 50 years. Uh, and, but, you know, I, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm on the board of Lockheed Martin. And uh, I've been down to the Skunk Works and talked to the engineer who's overseeing this, and he really believes this time we've got some potential. Uh, and that this could go forward. And think about what that might do in terms of nuclear promise. This thing, if you lose power or there's a problem, you shut it down, it's over. It disappears completely. I mean, there, the thing shuts itself down. There is no uh, residual heat or anything that has to be dealt with. And, uh, and we've been the beneficiaries of, uh, of, of this type of nuclear power for centuries. When I was at INPO, I had a guy that worked for me. You've probably got friends that do the same thing. It always had a little bon mot, a little saying under his signature on his email. And he says, we've been nu using nuclear energy for the, uh, uh, for the desalination of seawater for centuries. It's called rain. And uh, the fact of the matter is, and the point he was making, that the sun itself is, uh, is, a, is a fusion vehicle and the like and, uh, and offers uh, you know, the great ability to, uh, 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 to do that in the benefit of all mankind. So again, not telling you what the answers are. That's why the question mark is after not. But where are we? And what do we see as the future? When we're looking at all of the opportunities here to redesign an electric grid, the proponents of nuclear and rethinking nuclear are saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, why would we want to go to something that's 50% coal when we could go to something that's zero? Why not, instead of renewables, gas, and nuclear, why not renewables and nuclear in a, in a, 
in an appropriate way with new designs that are much safer and, uh, and the like. And there's a lot of research in the valley and elsewhere with thoughtful people just like you that are out there exploring what's in the realm of the possible rather than accepting the answers that perhaps were crafted on data that may be uh, decades old. And so that's my message here today. Thank you for your, uh, your attention, and I'd be delighted to take any questions. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Yeah, so one thing I'm wondering about is what makes nuclear energy so expensive right now? Well, it's, it's a great point, and uh, there are several pieces to it. First off, uh, there's a regulatory requirement. There's a, as, as you might want appropriately, how much safety and oversight is required. The average nuclear power plant in the United States of mid-size, a single reactor unit, has about 700 people that work there. You know how many people work at the average gas-fired plant? It's probably 35 or 40, you know, so there's, there's human costs associated with this. These are very highly skilled and trained people. Now, the good news is that in the case of current existing nuclear, all those costs have been written off. They're depreciated. They're fully depreciated. The cost of fuel in the, in the nuclear fuel cycle is only probably 20% of the, of the operating cost. In a natural gas plant, it's... 80% of the, of the cost, so, and the cost of uranium is declining. So some of the costs for nuclear are going down, but when you're in the merchant marketplace, and the, and the reason I, I may emphasize merchant, maybe you, some of you understand the markets that are out there. It was, a, it was an insight to me when I, uh, when I first got into the, uh, into the private sector. If you're in a regulated utility, you can pass the appropriate costs with the approval of the Public Utility Commission on to your ratepayers. If, they, if, the, if the Public Utilities Commission, overseeing the, the, the best interests of the people, believes it's an appropriate thing to do. If you're in a merchant environment, as Exelon and others are in the Northeast, you're in the marketplace. And it doesn't matter. What matters is the cost at, at the bus bar, the, the, you know, the cost per megawatt hour. And you cannot compete with, uh, with $2 a therm gas. I mean, you just cannot. So there, there, are, there are infrastructure costs that are there. There are security costs there. When the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, which is a, a very good organization, uh, it was created about uh, uh, five years before Three Mile Island uh, to kind of get the, the overseers away from the, uh, the advocates, and you will. But all of its funding, or the bulk of its funding, comes from the nuclear, from the utilities. It doesn't get any, it, doesn't, it gets very little federal funds. So if you want to license a new nuclear power plant, for example, you have to pay millions to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the privilege of having them review your license application and let you do it. So there are lots of, of hidden costs, if you will, that go to nuclear. And, and I'm not going to get into the subsidy kind of arguments, but if George was here, uh, Schultz, I'd ask him his views on uh, what he calls a revenue neutral carbon tax, because he believes that we have to level the playing field and, and let everybody play on the same sheet of music, not with you know, yelling past each other, but looking honestly about what does it cost and what carbon footprint do you have. And he believes that in that situation, nuclear would do well. And a lot of the analysis shows that uh, once you get rid of some of the subsidies that, uh, that flow to, to those that, uh, uh, that are needing it or getting it in, in this day and age. So there's a lot of issues. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly complex problem. But a lot of it's just the, the oversight and the, and the regulatory process and the, the administration uh, that it takes to, to make sure that these things are done well and safely. But there, there are initiatives to drive costs down in nuclear, and that's what some of these new designs and new technologies can bring if the regulator allows it. Yes, ma'am. No, I, I'm, not, I'm trying not to pick winners and losers, but, uh, and, I, and I breezed past it in the interest of time, but there are some that are just fascinating. I mean, there's mol molten salt designs, for example, that are much lower waste and, than like. There's a traveling wave version that, uh, uh, that Bill Gates is interested in that actually consumes its own waste when you think about it. I mean, so, you know, it, it, yes, it creates waste, but then it burns that. And so, it, and so there's, there's things out there that in the, in the realm of physics are theoretically possible, but that have not been funded to the point where they, they've uh, created full-scale uh, models and, uh, and test units. But that's what's in the cusp. If we can find a way to deal with the first-of-a-kind costs, and whose role is it to invest in that? Is it the government's role? Well, I mentioned how in, indirectly the government subsidized all of this 
through the Navy nuclear program. Is it, is it the role now? You should have asked Steve Chu when he was here. You know, I asked him that uh, you know, when he was, after he came back to campus when he, from when he was Secretary of Energy. He said, well, if I were king, this is what I would do. And I said, Steve, you were king. You know, no, I, I, that's not fair. He, he was just the chair of the department, but, or the, the head of the department, the secretary. But, but my point is, well, how do we think about this as a nation? What do we want to do going forward? And how do we think about the, the realities and the needs of electricity? Not for us. I mean, we worry about finding a socket to recharge our iPhones and all the rest. Do you know that nearly 25% of the world does not have access to electricity today? Zero. I mean, this is a, this is, you talk about poverty and inequality. How do we deal with this, uh, this poverty of energy and, and how it impacts people's lives around the world? There's an opportunity here if we think about it in a, in a holistic way. So I, I've got the big zero here, the big goose egg. I hope that's not my score. I mean, uh, you're not the East German judge, are you? All right, no, they don't exist anymore. Okay, all right. All right, thank you all very much. Thanks.